So would you turn in your Bible to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Pastor John preached from Matthew 6, 25 to 34, and he pre- on August 23rd, 2020. I believe that was the first Sunday, the first Sunday we met in this building. And so it was interesting when I look back, um, remembering that. And I'm not going to re-preach that section, but verse 33 was transformational in my life as a 16-year-old. I think we have a a couple of 16-year-olds in here, and my son is 16. Um, This verse was pivotal in my life. And so I want to encourage you with it and challenge you to consider Matthew 6, 33 this morning. But before we jump in, I want to remind you of how to get to sermons like Pastor John's sermon or Pastor Tim's sermons or one of mine and there are others. And the reason it matters is in God's providence, um, most of the sermons preached here and our, that are on our church app or our website were preached by men who, who were given to you by Jesus and who will give an account for your souls before him. And so these sermons carry special weight. So I just wanted to go over that with you. Um, I am willing to go by faith that this will work despite all the times Pastor John assured us that it was it was working and didn't. So I, and, and then he assured me he would be back there. So I am going to put my trust and confidence in the Lord and rest in him completely. Um, so I just wanted to go through this app. It is working now. So we've got, we're good. So the app on your phone, it's, uh, it's Church Center. Is that right? Yes, Church Center app. And you click on it and it'll take you to this home page and you can click on the sermons links. And then from there, you can go to recent sermons and then view all, and then you can pick by topic, by passage, by preacher, and I did it, I think both, Matthew, Pastor John, and then you can scroll down, and I found the sermon by the title, and so then I was able to listen to it, and a little hint for those of you who like to do this kind of thing, um, our brains go a lot faster than, um, than we give them credit for, I think, and so my children think their brains go faster than they really do, I think, because they listen to things on at least double, often triple speed. But you can go onto YouTube or even on the Sermon Audio app, and you can bump the speed up a little bit. And it actually is very helpful. And so I'm going to start speeding up a little bit in my talking right now, <laughs> because I know that you all are going to have trouble paying attention to me. But it helps to have a little visual interaction. But if you're not just sitting and watching a video, and even them, they, they will go, th- go through a lot more video and audio by listening to it on double or triple speed. So you can do that. And I actually did that with Pastor John's sermons. I did have to pause it more often to take some notes, because I'm going to give you a little bit of what he said. All right. So that's a, just a reminder of how you can get to these sermons. So... Verse 33, Matthew 6, 33, there's a little wording change, but this is a, a slide I had from way back. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In Pastor John's sermon, he pointed out that this verse in the, is in the context of worry. The point in the text is about priority and what we focus on in life. He asked, do you live for the heavenly or for the earthly? We all naturally worry, especially about what we're going to need or what we want in this life. But Jesus says that his people are not to worry even about the essential things in life. Um, Instead, he gives us the alternative, which is to seek first the kingdom of God. Pastor John said that seek means to make a priority, to, to make it your pursuit. So our priority is to be the kingdom of God, which, which is summarized as God's rule. We're to pursue obedience and submission to God, who's the king. We're to pursue what the king says is right. We're to lift our eyes up from the things of this earth to the things of heaven so we don't make the earthly things a priority. We must not worry about our needs. Instead, we're to serve the king who's able to meet our needs. I thought that was a really helpful phrase. Don't worry about your needs worry or serve the king who's able to meet your needs. There still will be trouble every day, but God will supply. So this is in contrast to how the Gentiles or those who don't know God live. They don't live in submission to God. So look at, look again at Matthew 6 um, verses 31 to 34. I'm going to be giving you a lot of Bible this morning, and I've put it all as on the screen. So if that's simpler for you, or if you want to turn there, that's fine. Matthew 6, we're already there. So verse 31, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? 
Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Shortly after I was saved, as I mentioned, when I was the age of 16, I did my first Bible study, real like dig into words in this section. And it, it came alive to me as I started to study the word seek and look at it in other passages and the word first and the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I remember concluding that this passage was talking about seeking God first. Everything led back to him. It's his kingdom, his righteousness, it's his rule. It's about his will for my life, and he must have the highest priority, the first place in everything. And, and so I remember that being convicting, like, boy, I really need to do that, and exciting, like this is something I get to be a part of. And you know, it still is that way for me. It's both convicting and exciting, and I hope to share some of that excitement and conviction with you this morning. At the same time, dad had me memorize Colossians 3, and it said the same thing, and, and I would personalize it. Since I have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I need to set my mind on things that are above, not on things on the earth. For I have died, and my life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is my life, will appear, then I'm going to appear with him in glory. I said, yes, Lord, I'm going to seek Christ first. I will live for God's kingdom and let him rule my life. Then during that first year after I was saved in my personal Bible reading, I came to First and Second Chronicles, and it's just all through there. You're going to get to see that here. First Chronicles 16.10 says, Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And then seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Now set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with your whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. And think of Solomon. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. 2 Chronicles eleven sixteen, 16, and those who had set their hearts to seek the Lord, the God of Israel, they came and they sacrificed to the Lord, the God of their fathers. And this particular king did what was evil, for he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. And then if you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And in chapter 15, 12, and they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, with all their heart and with all their soul. In chapter 16, in the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet, and his disease became severe. Yet, even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from the physicians. It doesn't mean you don't seek help from the physicians, but when you do that in place of seeking the Lord, then there's a big problem. And then in 2 Chronicles 20, then Jehoshaphat, who was afraid, he set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout Judah. And then Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And then he himself, he set himself, this is one of the other kings, to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And so these passages made an influence on me. They made a big difference in my heart. And both Matthew 6 and Chronicles, there's this critical contrast of the unbelievers, those who don't know God, and the believers, the disciples, who live for the kingdom of God, who seek God. There were the kings, and then the peoples who, who, kings who sought the Lord, and the, the kings who didn't seek the Lord. And same with the people, those who prospered, and those who did evil and failed in the eyes of God. And I can remember thinking, I want to prosper spiritually. I don't want to be one of those who fall away or turn away and seek other things. I wanted to seek the Lord with all my heart and with all my soul. And as a young man, I did what, what one of those passages, I think there are a couple of places in the Old Testament, to describe making a covenant with the Lord to seek Him with my whole heart. And I remember being quite concerned because a covenant is a very serious thing. 
And, um, and so I thought, but no, if I don't do this, I'm a failure as a believer. And so I am going to commit and to covenant with the Lord to seek him. Now, I've done that imperfectly, but by the grace of God, I stand here this morning still doing my best to seek the Lord with all my heart. And I want that to be true for you also. And so there's one more thing I want you to look at from the passage here in Matthew chapter 6, because I think it's a parallel, and I'm going to use it this morning in the sermon. And um, it's the Lord's Prayer. Verse 7, Jesus says, And when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles. Here's another contrast. For they think they're going to be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So what do you do? Well, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I don't know if you see it, but our Heavenly Father knows what we need, and there's a parallel here. He says what we really need is for His name to be hallowed, for His kingdom to come, for His will to be done. He's going to provide what you need, your daily bread, as you ask Him. He'll forgive your sins. He'll lead you from temptation and deliver you from evil, and it fits really well with um, verses 31 to 34. So based on Matthew 6, 33 and these other passages, I'm going to preach to you on seeking God first, or as a command, seek God first. And we're going to connect both Matthew 6, 33 and the Lord's Prayer. So number one, I think you have a handout that may help you keep located in where we are. Number one, seek God first so that his name will be hallowed. To be hallowed means to treat as holy, to show reverence. It's, it's the idea of worship. What does this look like for you to seek God first so that his name will be reverenced or worshiped? Well, first of all, seek to praise God's name and you will reverence him more and more. God's name is who he is and what he's like, what he's done. Seek to know him more and, and, and as you know him better, you will praise him and reverence him. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 16, which we read earlier, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Glory in him. Glory in him means, or glory in, is used for the word praise or the idea of praising someone. And to do that, you need to know who they are and what they're like and that they're worthy of praise. With God, the creator, the king, the judge, the savior, and more. He's an, he, he has an infinite amount that is worthy of our praise. He is glorious. And when we know, and uh, you, know, you think about someone who is especially gifted or especially godly in some area, you praise them. We talk about them. How much more of our Father in heaven, who is the glorious one in all the earth, in all the universe, Okay, and now another aspect of hallowing the Lord's name is to seek to give Jesus first place in everything. This is part of what's going on in the church. It comes from the word preeminence. Jesus has the highest position and priority because of who he is and what he's done. He has the name, which is above every name, Philippians says. And look first at Colossians 1. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace through the blood of his cross. Jesus has first place in everything. And then Philippians 2, verse 8, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so giving Jesus preeminence means Jesus being Lord in what you believe, and Lord in what you think. 
Jesus is Lord over your attitudes, your words, your choices, your actions. And I remember praying, dear Lord Jesus, what do you want me to do? You're my Lord. And he, and he taught me and is teaching me through his word. And he does the same for you. This is a lifelong pursuit of giving Jesus first place in everything. And so we seek to make his name great. We praise his name. And then we seek to make his name known to others. And in doing so, we'll fulfill our mission. 1 Corinthians or 1 Chronicles 16.8 uh, says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, and then make it known his deeds among the peoples. That's something God has always wanted his people to do. Make his name known. In Matthew 28, verse 18, this is the Great Commission. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. This is Jesus' commission for us to go and make him known to others. When you think about how we can do that, I think living out our church mission statement is a perfect way to hallow God's name and to seek him first. It says our mission statement, which may be hard to read here, but you can look it up online. For the glory of God, Grace Bible Church exists to make faithful followers of Christ who pursue Christ-like maturity by growing to know more of God's unique greatness, by seeking to value him above everything else and then living to make him known to others. We have those pictures out in the lobby so that you'll use them, so that you'll meditate on them. We have this new track that there, it's in a display case. They're right by the, the pictures. You can take those, use those for your own heart and then with others. And so we have these tools, these means to make his name hallowed. So number one, seek God first so that his name will be hallowed. Now, number two, seek God first so his kingdom will come. I'm going to back up this little sneak preview. There's a sense in which God's kingdom is going to come, whether we pray for it or not, whether we seek it or not. And yet God tells us to pray for it to come. He commands us to seek it as our priority. It's the Great Commission, and it's an awesome privilege that we get to be part of that. It's a privilege to be advancing the kingdom of God. God gives us the desire and ability to seek for his rule in the hearts of people to spread more and more. And we do that by showing and telling others about Jesus. Now, this is the sneak preview. Foreign missionaries give their lives for that purpose. It's one of the reasons that our, our pastor and eight of our church family are over there with them in Togo. And we got to see them this morning. It was a surprise to me and very fun to get to see them. Um, and so they're at this hospital in Togo. My computer's doing weird things. There we go. And this is when they first arrived there on the missionary station. And I want to show you some pictures from people that are there that they're going to meet or people we've met there before. And I want to remind you of how these people that are like you, they're people just like you, but they've given their lives fully as missionaries to spread the good news of Jesus. And so I don't have any script for here, so I got to keep moving. This is going to get dangerous. So the ones that we know as part of our church family, Tom and Melissa Kendall, they're a husband and wife who are serving the Lord together there. And Melissa has that huge pile of Ritz crackers because she loves to give those out. To the, there's kids all over the compound. Like there are pictures, I don't know if you saw the new pictures this morning on the church website, but all those children that they're ministering to, well, they come and they get crackers from Miss Melissa. And then Melissa does, this is, this is a setting that will probably be very similar to what the team will be doing their VBS in. He mentioned the Muslim neighborhood. That's what this is. And as a mother on the mission field, you don't always have happy kids. You notice Eden's face? And so as a missionary, you are spreading the gospel and seeking first the kingdom as a mom, as a wife, as a, as a missionary doing outreach. Dr. Tom does several different things as a man, as a missionary, seeking first the kingdom of God. Those are chaplains, three of, I think, six or eight chaplains. And he had had a chaplain Bible study with them. And if you can see the word above that door, it says something like administration. Yeah, it actually says it in English. Look at that. You can read that. Um, so he does administration over the hospital, and he's responsible for leading that team. 
But then he's also a surgeon. In this particular surgery, he's teaching another physician who's done some surgery in residency but wasn't a specialist. And so Tom was teaching this surgeon how to do an amputation. And I spared you. I didn't put it in these pictures. But I have them if you want to see some bloody pictures. But then Tom is also, as a missionary, he's a pastor of the missionary. So this is the setting. That's the room where Pastor Tim was talking to us from. And that's what's going to happen in about an hour or so. They're going to meet just like this. And Tom mission, um, serves them, pastors those people in that place. I want to point out these are some new missionaries. They, they, the ones, um, this, team, this couple right here had just arrived with their three children. And they are surgeons. He's a surgeon. She's a surgeon's wife. And they're to love her children and to, sh to be a missionary. It was, they were 16 when God started to work on their heart and got him ready to go to the mission field. And that was his first week on the mission field as a missionary. This couple, same kind of thing. He was 16 years old when he said, I'm going to seek God first. And he was going to do it by going to the mission field. And now he's a surgeon. He's doing some language study. They're expecting their first child, and they're on the mission field. This is a picture of missionary wives or single ladies who are there serving the Lord. They're seeking God first on the mission field, loving them. And look at it. There's lollipops on the table. There's popcorn. You can be a normal person on the mission field, advancing the kingdom and enjoying. There were s'mores that night, too. This is a group of men, highly trained, skilled professionals in medicine. And they're there. The tall guy there, the dark hair and beard, he is the one who lost his daughter to cancer recently. Going and serving God and seeking him first doesn't keep you from deep sorrow and pain. And then you've, you've got a man on the end, um, Gerald, that I'm going to tell you about here in just a minute. But take the, the medical missionaries. They're there serving the Lord. The guy in the middle, Dr. Ebersol, has been there for 25 years. And uh, he's a pediatrician. I'll tell you about him more in a minute. The man on the outside, the same guy on each side because it's an extra picture. He's a surgeon who sadly lost his wife at a young age and decided to give his life to being a medical missionary since that time. Um, Dr. Ebersol, I mentioned, he's a pediatrician and has loved the Lord by loving these children and telling them about Jesus. He got all excited as he's helping these kids. He comes in with a stack of these books. One of the missionaries there is a photographer, and she takes pictures and writes books. And in the book, it tells the gospel with the pictures of the animals from Africa. And Dr. Ebersol comes in and goes through that with the moms and the kids after and while he's taking care of them. This little girl had cancer. He and his wife, though, after 25 years, need to come off the mission field because her health is failing and there's some time they want to spend with their kids and grandkids. They have four children that they raised on the mission field who love the Lord. In fact, one of their sons goes to my parents' church in South Carolina, and that was fun to see them. These are, these are short-term missionaries. Uh, you can't quite see her, but I'm going to point her out. The lady on the far left here is an Australian um, OBGYN doctor, and she was there taking care of moms and babies. And then you've got a surgeon who's semi-retired who comes often, and then you've got another retired doctor, OBGYN, whose daughter is a physician in the picture, and he had come to visit his daughter and grandson, and she's expecting another one. And then there's a surgeon, her, her husband, and they're there serving the Lord, seeking God first by using their skill. But if you're not a surgeon and a doctor, I'm not. What about a plant grower? Are you a gardener? This guy, Gerald, was in his church in Idaho a few years back, and his pastor came home and said, I know what God could use you to do. Because in school, he learned about aquaponics. It's growing plants and, and through using water and fish. There's a bunch of tilapia in these tanks out there in Africa. Whoever gave them advice, though, originally didn't think through the whole uh, <clears throat> humidity. And so aquaponics is terribly, working terribly there in Africa. So his job, Gerald, is to come and transform their use of it. He said they're going to become very expensive raised beds for gardening. But right now he's planting um, vegetables. He's raising and beginning to raise goats and sheep to feed the blind school. The goal is that the blind children and the teachers will be able to eat off of what they grow on that property and save their largest budget item, which is the food. And so he's there using his skill. Another man, maybe you're a business guy, uh, Andy Kirby there in the middle of your picture. He's got a master in business, MBA, and he's there helping with administration and with teaching. I think they've come off the field as of right now. I don't know if they're going to go back, but they were there for a couple years because they saw this advertisement of a teacher needed. And he didn't know it was a missionary teacher. He just called, followed up on the ad, and in God's providence, a year or two later, he's on the mission field with his family and doing a remarkable work. He's the one who kept 
that mission field running with another African while Tom and Melissa were here sitting in our services. Um, then you've got a guy like this, Matthew Weathers. I'm sure he would love that picture. But he's there showing Brandon the optical or the fiber optic cables and the Cat 6 cables. He's running through this new building that they're building to do digital video and audio recordings of the gospel and teaching for the Africans all through that area. And so maybe you just don't know any of that stuff. And what is Cat 6? You only have one cat and that's enough. Um, well, do you know anything about... Um, handyman work. This guy is probably the most important man on that entire mission compound. And um, his name is John Tusink, and he's getting older, but he takes care of everything. He, get these, he has these men who come, and they tend to work with him for a year or two, and then they're gone. I think it may say something about how hard it is. He keeps on going, and then these young guys come and last about a year or two, and then another one comes, and Lord willing, we'll get someone to stick it out and replace him. But he fixes everything, and then this man, he brought his family there because he teaches people like you to teach children in Sunday school and in children's church. The Africans don't understand means of teaching their children in, uh, in the church, and so his whole, his whole ministry is to teach them. Their newest child has Down syndrome, and this is Ron Washer, Melissa's dad. And he has a special affinity toward that Downs baby because they have a grandbaby, not one of Tom and Melissa's babies, but another grandbaby who has Down syndrome. So he was so excited to meet him. But this is a man who's planted three churches there in that area and is now the director of Africa. He's seeking God first through his missionary endeavors. And what he was doing for the day I was there or two, he was making a swing so his granddaughters could swing in the big trees there. And so seeking God first looks all sorts of different ways. The question is, are you, by, your, by God's grace and the whole focus of your life, seeking God first? We know that about missionaries, but we all have the same commission to share the good news of Jesus, the King, and to teach others to obey his command. And it starts by us learning of him, learning Jesus, obeying him, and it continues as we disciple others in the way that we're following Jesus. And it keeps going as we share Jesus with those who don't know about him. And then let me ask you just point blank. Why shouldn't you be a foreign missionary? Why not? Why not you? Just something you ought to think about. God said, go into all the world to preach the gospel. And if not, God has most of us here on purpose, and that's a good thing. We need to be here. We need to be supporting them, praying for them. Um, but if not, we must be about the Lord's business, right? And making disciples where we are. Okay, so that's the first two of four reasons. I think the others will move fairly quickly. Let's, number one, remember, seek God first so his name will be hallowed. Number two, seek God first so his kingdom will come. Number three, Seek God first so his will will be done. Pray for God's will to be done through you. Seek first God's righteousness. And this is the parallel idea with God's kingdom coming since God's righteousness will be his subjects doing his will in the kingdom. But there are some additional ideas to God's righteousness that I want us to think about. God's will is for us to find our righteousness in Christ. Look at Romans 3. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Seek Jesus first. And then 1 Corinthians 1, 26, For consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being will boast in his presence. And because of him are you in Christ Jesus, who became to us, Jesus became to us wisdom from God, 
Jesus became to us righteousness from God and sanctification and redemption so that as it is written, let us who boast, boast in the Lord. Seek Jesus as our righteousness from God. And then Philippians 3. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but a righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith in Jesus, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that I may be, it may be possible that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead like Jesus did. So seeking God's righteousness for us in Christ is a point in time work that God the Spirit does in our hearts, but it's also a lifelong seeking to know and experience more of it. Now, next, there's God's will for us to be conformed to the righteousness of Christ. Romans 12, I appeal to you, brothers, at the, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. One of the translations says it's a reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Jesus is God's perfect, good, and acceptable Son, with whom He is well pleased, and we are being made like Him in holiness. And then 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, we're being transformed into the same image, from one glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who's the Spirit. And so we're being into the, changed into the same righteous image of Jesus. In Ephesians 5, verse 1, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So verse 15, look carefully how you live, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. This contrast, not as the Gentiles, but as a follower of Jesus, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, which we were told, verse 2, is to walk as Jesus walked, to be imitators of God. And that is how we will do the will of our Father and be righteous, conforming or being conformed to the image of Christ. So, God's will is for us to be conformed to the righteousness of Christ by the power of the Spirit. We learn of Jesus. We learn of Him in the Bible. We obey Him in everyday life. And then number four, we seek God first so He will give us what we need. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him, Jesus said. Pray, Father, give us our daily bread. God knows you need food. He knows you need water. He knows you need clothing. But even in that, we're to trust God, to pray, and to live free from worry about those things so that we can seek to advance the kingdom of God and display His righteousness. And we're going to have to work hard to provide for ourselves, to provide for our families. The Bible says if we don't, we're worse than an infidel. And if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. But we don't worry about those things. We need to overcome that worry by faith in God and prayer. And one of the reasons is because we're going to face, you know this, but we face real needs every day. Even the basic physical needs, there are going to be times when we're wondering where the next meal will come from. Not too much in America, but it does happen. And the Africans that they're meeting in Africa there, our team, many of them are working on what they're going to eat today, what they're going to eat tonight. And so it's a different setting, but we do face real needs every day. Let me remind you of a real need that was faced by the, the disciples, even when Jesus was there with them. This is in Luke chapter 9. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came to him and said, Hey, send the crowd away to go into the surrounding village and countryside to find lodging, to get food, to provisions. Um, we're here in a desolate place out in the wilderness. He said to them, You, you give them something to eat. 
They said, we don't even, I mean, the most we have, and we've gone looking, is five loaves and two fish. Um, maybe we could go buy some food, but I remember them even saying in another passage that, you know, where are we going to go buy food for this many? Because there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, well, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so. And he had them sit down. And, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing over them. And he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all... 5,000 men plus women and children ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. And I'm sure they had leftovers for a little while. They had a real physical need. But Jesus knew how he would meet it and the way that he would meet it. And it was something that they had never seen. You go, you know what? I mean, we were with Jesus. That would have been easy. I'd have figured that out. No, you wouldn't have. You'd have been there and just as worried as them saying, we don't have anything. Just like in the boat, you'd have been just as worried as they were. We're the same, made of the same stuff. And they'd never seen that before. Jesus hadn't done that before. Now, he did do it twice in the Gospels and they, they struggled the second time. So be careful. You might think, well, I'd never worry about that again. Well, we all struggle with our basic needs from time to time. Jesus is able to provide for our needs. Now, it's not likely that in our lifetime he'll ever provide like that. But he's the same God, and you're his followers. And so when you face need, call out to him and say, Jesus, we've left all to follow you. I'm seeking you first. Provide for my needs. So we're going to face real needs. We're also going to face fears. You know this. The story of Jehoshaphat that is part of our Seek First passages and Chronicles gives us a story about fearing and what to do. Verse, uh, chapter 20, some of the men came and told Jehoshaphat, and I, I get Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, I'm going to say it both ways so I cover all my bases. A great multitude is coming against you. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and he set his face to seek the Lord. That's a good thing. And proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. And from the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O oh, Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we're powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So God knows you have fears. The question is, where do you look with your fears? Will you turn your eyes of faith to God and trust him to meet your needs? That is part of seeking him first. And then we're going to have suffering. Second Corinthians tells us a story of Paul's sufferings. Listen to this. You're aware of it, but I want you to hear it again. Paul says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, except one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all of the churches. Who's weak and I'm not weak? Who is made full and I'm not, in, or who, who's made to fall and I'm not indignant? I'm, I'm emotionally bearing that weight. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Man, you know, be careful who you want to be like. I mean, you want to imitate Paul. Whew. So what's going on? Verse 7, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. There's more context there, but Three times Paul pleads with the Lord to take away this suffering, this thorn in the flesh. But he said to me, uh -uh, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Whew. Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more 
gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, with insults, with hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, that's kind of extreme, and that's part of the point. We're supposed to conclude that if God's grace is sufficient for Paul in his suffering, his grace will be sufficient for us in our suffering. And I know it's hard, and it's impossible for us, apart from the grace of God, in seeking him first in our suffering. But the Bible says in our passage that the Father knows what we need even before we ask him. He knows what you need in your suffering. And in order to even preach that to you, I just have to stand on the authority of what God says and trust that God will provide for your needs in your suffering. Because I don't have the, the adequacy or any kind of close ability to empathize with your suffering. And so trust that God, as you seek him first, will provide for your needs in suffering. But then there's this. God provides for our needs one day at a time. Did you notice in Matthew 6, verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. I'd rather, I remember in the dental office with my dad, he would say, we're going to pray, give us this day our daily patience. And someone, one pastor once asked him, what do you mean, like patient? Like, did you have struggle with anger and impatience? And dad said, yes, but that's not what I mean. I mean, people that need teeth fixed. Ideally, broken teeth that need a crown or, you know, a bridge or an implant. And so here, there's a jar on my desk that's candy, hard candy with ice cubes. Eat candy, chew ice, and support your local dentist. So, you know, you pray and use whatever means at your disposal, I guess. But we, I remember many times, give us this day. I'm, I'm not kidding. He said all those things. He did them in, in jest. But, um, and it paid provided well for our family. Okay, Matthew 6, 30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field... Oh, no, what I was going to say with that, that's not in my notes. That's why I went that way. Um, what I was going to say was we would pray for our daily patience, but what we really wanted was two weeks full schedule of patience. Then we could pray as more sanctified Christians. Give us this day our daily patience, and I'm glad I got two weeks full of patience who are supposed to show up. Well, but God doesn't promise two weeks of full schedules. God, he says in verse uh, 6, Matthew 6, 30, he clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is gone. Now, he only has one day, to, one chance to provide for them. Oh, you of little faith, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And this is just plain convicting. Lord, please help me. Seek God one day at a time. Trust God to provide one day at a time. Now, it's wise to store and provide. Remember the ant? You sluggard, go, provide, save, be ready, but don't trust in those riches. And all God promises is today's provision. So rest in that. And then take your focus and, and put it on his kingdom work. And then God provides for our needs and more than we need. So many of our wants. And he does it as an incentive. Now this is, I mean, again, this is God. He says this. God says to pray because our Father knows what you need before you ask him. And he's going to give us what we really need each day. And he says to seek the kingdom and his righteousness. And, to, and store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I'm getting ahead of myself. Matthew 6, 19 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where neither moth and rust destroy or thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Seek him first and put your treasures in heaven, where neither moth or rust destroy and thieves don't break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We're supposed to be savers for eternity, savers for eternal riches. A heart that seeks God will first store up as much heavenly wealth as possible. And along those same lines, did you know that God says he rewards those who seek him? And this is where I was going a minute ago. Hebrews eleven six, And without faith, it is impossible to please God because those who come to God must believe that he is and that he rewards those who seek him. It is a not, a, it's not a wrong motive to seek God so that he will reward you. That's, that's his idea. Now, 
Heavenly rewards are his primary gift to us. Those are the ones that last and are best. Spiritual rewards, knowing Jesus more, seeing people come into the kingdom. But he is not negligent of food, clothing, shelter, and good things. So seek God first as a way to gain his promised rewards. And let him, you're going to have to, let him decide what those rewards will be. So he provides for our needs and rewards us according to his will as we seek him first. All right, so that was a bit of a fire hydrant of verses and truths. But they all really work together to make one critical point, and it's right there in front of you. Seek God first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I urge you to determine this morning by the grace of God to trust him with all the other things that you worry about or that you wonder about. God, our almighty King and Heavenly Father, says, I know what you need, and they'll be added to you. But you seek first my kingdom, and all these things will be provided. So we're going to pray, and I would encourage you to do what I did. And if you're not ready, I understand Maybe make it a commitment. Maybe in your, in your mind that's less weighty, and I think in some respects it is. But in your own words, tell the Lord, I am, I am deciding today, I'm making a covenant to seek God first, to seek you first with all my heart. And the Bible says he will reward you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name and through the blood of Jesus, thanking you for the, the sacrifice that was paid, for the righteousness of Christ, that we, are, that we are hidden in him. We are safe in him. We have hope because of Jesus. All of the law and the prophets testify to the fact that we could not seek you enough. We could not obey you enough apart from the righteousness of Christ. And yet, because of Christ, and because the Holy Spirit is in us, we have the desire and the power to seek you first as our highest priority. And I pray that this morning, each one here would in their own heart decide before you that by your grace and for your glory, they will seek you with all their heart, that they will put you first, and I pray that your spirit would enable them, encourage them to wait on you to provide for what they need and to be their highest reward. You know exactly what to reward us with. And I pray that whatever you provide for us, monetarily, with life, with whatever, we would just keep on using and putting back in and reinvesting into eternal treasures in the hearts and lives of people who need Jesus. And we ask you for this. By your grace, in Jesus' name, amen.